Um, so thank you for being here. Um, we have an exciting webinar scheduled for today, Rolling with Resistance. Um, and I want to introduce you to Pamela Corneo. Pamela is a PhD, a PhD candidate with, within the Counseling Psychology Program. Um, and Pamela's clinical interest and research efforts focus on increasing accessibility to mental health services. And good news, in the fall, she will begin her internship at Boston University's Center for Multicultural Training in Psychology. So great things happening for Pamela, including this webinar. We're excited to learn more. Um, Pamela, over to you. Okay, so we're talking about rolling with resistance today. And I specifically wanted to name that I, I'm going to be pulling from this framework of motivational interviewing, which is a collaborative conversation style for strengthening a person's own motivation and commitment to change. And that's the key element here, change. We talk about this word a lot, but don't actually name it outright. So when we have a client and we're helping them towards therapeutic growth, or we have a child who needs um, a different way of coping or a different way of asking for something, we're asking for change, a different way of doing something, right? Or a goal in mind. Now, some of us are very familiar with change, especially around New Year, where we think about, I'm gonna wanna do more physical things. I have a goal with my weight in mind, or I'm going to sleep or stop using my electronics before bed. I would love to see y'all in the chat mention, what are some changes that you have either worked on with your clients or sought out for yourself? So we're just going to think about change, some of those things that you've been seeking for. Um, and then for folks who are watching the recording later on, I'm going to name folks are naming how we relate to anxiety, how to eat healthier, how to take breaks when we're stressed, managing of screen time, more self-compassion. Awesome. So we're all very familiar with this idea of change and the ways in which we want to support it. So this is a key element for using or rolling with resistance because we know that change doesn't happen spontaneously. And in fact, it's a process. So within motivational interviewing, we conceptualize change in uh, stages. The first one is pre-contemplation. This is the moment in which we have no uh, commitment or ideas about how to do something differently. Now, I personally am in a pre-contemplative state when it comes to eating burgers. I love and enjoy a juicy cheeseburger with some fries and barbecue sauce. I'm not going to um, change my mind around. That is something that I'd like to continue eating at some point, right? But maybe for me, I'm aware that I shouldn't eat them every day. So uh, some of us have pre-contemplative beliefs or stages when it comes to our values or habits or the way that we can uh, manage our routines to function. Now that next stage is contemplation. So this is a stage in which you might be considering or reflecting on maybe this could have some room for change. Maybe I would like to do something different. It doesn't denote any sort of commitment, just that there's a possibility towards moving towards change. That next one is preparation. So this is a stage in which you might have thought, hmm, I think I would like to eat a certain way. So maybe I'll start to look up different recipes, learning more about nutrients and vitamins. So this is when we start to take some sort of actionable, thoughtful movement towards change. Now action, this stage is when you're actually implementing something to move towards change. So now you're in routines, you're cooking that stuff, you're allowing yourself to experience anxiety, right? Or sitting with it, observing it, taking note of it. The next stage is maintenance. So this is when we have moved through all those stages of change to a point where we are able to continue effortfully maintaining our change. Despite our best efforts, relapses are normal. We may have learned something new, but we're stressed. An event happens that derails our efforts and we might have a relapse. 
a going back to our previous behavioral engagements. This is something so important for us to normalize and understand that change doesn't happen all at once. It's not a straight line. We do have moments where we change directions, whether it's from having a new goal, a new idea, or simply our motivation wasn't enough to keep us going with that behavioral change. If we think about a client that you have now, so think of someone that you're working with consultatively or clinically, or even for yourself, what's a stage that that person is in right now? Could you include that in the chat? So just keeping an eye on the chat. I'm noticing a lot of people who are here today are finding this person that they're thinking of in preparation. So not quite in actionable places. They're not quite doing what we've discussed. They're not quite lined up with their goal in mind, but they're somewhere in the middle. So thank you for sharing that. Within the title, we were talking about resistance. Now, I want to be very careful about this concept. Resistance is not someone who doesn't want to change. And we want to come uh, and look at this from a strengths-based place, from a more um, accepting place. Folks may experience resistance or be in a state of resistance to behavioral change for a variety of reasons. So, and we'll get to that in a minute that what it looks like when we're relating to them or engaging with them are things like ignoring you, arguing, interrupting, or denying the situation, why they should change, why would they benefit or moving towards a different way of being. And that can further look like blaming something else for why they haven't made a change or disagreeing with you on even something they've named before or excusing, well, it's not that bad, it's kind of okay, it works out in the end, or minimizing or having some pessimism. So having resistance towards change or even directed towards you relationally is understandable. It's a defense, it's a way of us to take care of ourselves and protect ourselves from not following through with our goals. And there's also barriers to change. So if you could think of reasons for why someone might be resistant towards that, if you feel comfortable, please unmute yourself and name what sort of emotions might be behind having resistance. And there are no wrong answers because we all have individual experiences. So please. I know for myself and some of the consultative work that I've done. Uh, resistance will come up when whoever I'm consulting with feels like what they're doing should be enough or when they feel like changing would be too much work and they just don't have the energy or the capacity to, to implement the change that we're talking about. Thanks, Ben, that's a great example. Anyone else? I think disappointment as well, um, just like in ourselves, uh, we're like, I tried, I wanted this for myself and didn't do it. So it must reflect something negative or about myself. So just disappointment. I, hear I would that. also say, oh, sorry. No, Pamela. please go ahead, go ahead. I would also say fear for a lot of my clients, just doing something different is scary and they don't necessarily believe it's gonna work. I also feel maybe like regrets of certain decisions that they've made and just like wanting to go back and maybe admit, admit the regrets and maybe like wishing that they would have done things differently. Absolutely. And what I really love about folks' examples is that 
you're naming uh, those barriers, those emotional barriers that are based off of the real worries. They're tied to realistic pieces that people experience. So we can have failures, we can experience disappointments, we can be fearful. Um, we can have moments of doubting ourselves and our capacity to move towards change. And that might be reflected entirely in their truth where they have struggled making this change or others don't see the efforts that they have made. And so underneath our resistance, we can see that we have to work towards helping our clients or the person we're speaking with or our consultants have that vision and motivation for themselves. I'm going to focus on the folks that are within that pre-contemplation stage because they're our toughest clients or consultants or people to have these conversations with. Folks who um, you can tell are not quite ready to move towards change. And so we're going to talk about that rolling with resistance. So what do we do when they're absolutely verbally, maybe even sometimes physically, depending on who we're working with, not be ready to engage in these conversations? And I want to note that based on our research and my own personal experience, and I'm sure you all have had these moments too, our relationship with this individual is, is the most powerful tool for our clinical and consultative work. And this is something we need to build and preserve and continue to uh, grow. So what does this mean? What I'm really trying to get at is that rolling with resistance helps us by preventing relational ruptures. It demonstrates teamwork. So we're not going to push against their fears or their barriers. We're going to work with that. So it validates the person's experience because we're not joining in the minimizing, but we are giving space to where they're at in this process of change. And it establishes that person as the expert, which can sometimes feel counterintuitive for us when we're providing this work. Inherently in this relationship, there's a power differential based off of the roles that we have. If they're the client and we're the therapist, we're the consultant, we're naturally the expert here. However, for folks that are in pre-contemplation, that doesn't give us any leverage to um, strengthen that power differential. So instead we're giving our clients leverage in that relationship, in that vision building. So what it is, collaborative. We're working together to figure out what, is our, what are their barriers and what are they fearful of? What are they worried about? It's responsive in that we're not gonna push through and try to get them to change. We're going to be responsive to where they're at, especially when we're thinking of those folks in that pre-contemplative stage, which also means that it's insightful because we want our own clients to figure out what is the answer here and what are the problems. And through that insightfulness, they continue to figure out their own motivations. They don't need us to do that because what it's not, we're not the experts here. And in fact, these are the kinds of clients that have the autonomy to make their own decision making. So they're not children where we're trying to help persuade towards following the rules. They're folks who can experience true consequences for their decisions and be able to reflect that I don't want to live with these kinds of consequences or outcomes, and yet I am struggling. Right. And for folks who are in pre-contemplative state, they may not have made those connections because it's not up to us to make that connection. They must make it themselves. So in that way, we can't rush it. And at the same time, it is still focused. We know what the goal is. We know what uh, directional change our client needs. However, we're not at a place of how, we're in a place of why. And I just named that, we're focusing on why. That is what we do when we roll for resistance. Roll with, rolling with it means focusing on why, not just the how. The how is where we can be experts because they might name those barriers and say, well, I don't have the skills. I don't have the vision. I'm unsure of who to speak to. I don't know where this resource is. That is where we can facilitate and support change in that expert of role. But we can't provide the why. Every time we try to do it for them, we give the wrong answer. I reflect on when I ask my clients, what was the most helpful piece about our work together? And 100% they name something completely different from where my, my mind was at. 
And that's fine because they have their whys, they have their own processing. So what does it look like when someone is naming possibly interest in change? So there's a few broad categories. It's when they name something that suggests they have an ability, a reason, a need, a desire, commitment, or first step, first if then, so taking steps and problem recognition. Someone who's in pre-contemplation may not name these things just yet. Instead, they're going to continue to name all of the barriers, all their worries and all the moments where they weren't successful. So what do we do if we're not getting all of that change talk, the reasons and motivations, what can we do to get folks to name that on their own and have their own self insight? So the acronym that motivational interviewing uses is ORS. So I like thinking of it as that tool to navigate the waters of tough relational moments. So ORS is open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. So for folks, uh, I'd appreciate if you would just write down this acronym because we're going to use it later. This is going to feel intuitive. We know how to have open-ended questions. We know how to affirm or note a client's strengths like, I know that doing your homework has been really hard this week. However, I've seen you finish your homework on time before. Or I see that right now it's been really tough to implement this strategy within your classroom. I also saw last week how well your students responded when you use verbal praise, right? So that's being affirming. We know how to listen and reflect back what they're saying. We know that if they tell us long stories, we gotta give a summary back. But the intention when we're having clients who are in that pre-contemplative stage is to help them shift from feeling like I cannot do this, this is not worth my time towards having a conversation about change. So I'm so sorry if this is feeling maybe not as concrete, you want some examples or ideas. Um, oh, there we go, screenshot this, this will come in handy later. Actually, I want to pause for a second. Are there any questions or thoughts around you, the using ORs or if you personally within your work, which one feels more comfortable? Which one do you lean towards? I know in my own work, I, I feel like the reflections and the summaries are the ones that I tend to lean towards more. They just feel really natural for me. Um, but I, I also would say that those moments that I lean into an affirmation tend to be the moments that I see kind of a light bulb go off. Um, I found it to be really, really useful to, to mix it up a little bit and throw that in there too. Thank you, Ben. And I'm seeing folks in the chat name that they lean towards affirmations, so strengths-based statements, and for another person, reflections. Thank you. Um, I find myself using a lot of open-ended questions, um, mostly because I'm curious to understand how is my client thinking or feeling in this moment? What am I missing right now? Especially as someone who definitely leans towards, I know this is a, an important change to make and I really wanna get there now. However, I know that if I push it, if I urge my client towards change, it's just not going to uh, be sustainable or worse can lead them to say, well, I can't talk about these things with, with Pamela because she really wants that for me and I'm going to be disappointing her on top of myself in this moment. Okay, um, I'm naming this now that we have these resources for folks who are really interested in, well, this was a great snippet, but I really want more. What can I do? What does this look like with clients who are in the other stages of change? So I'll name that a resource that I have been very appreciative and have used in the past is motivational interviewing in school, specifically if you're a school-based person. Um, there are other motivational interviewing books that are used in a variety of treatment focuses and um, 
settings. You just have to Google it and look it up and you'll find it. That MI for Schools org is directly tied to that school-based uh, book. And then if you're interested in actual uh, training or other resources, you wanna learn more, then the mi.org is the best place to go. I wanna thank the folks who are here, uh, who are watching the recording. Um, I hope that you have found this uh, uh, helpful in terms of planting a seed towards working with folks who are in a pre-contemplative state. And we're gonna pause the recording or stop the recording now because we're moving towards experiential part of the webinar. <laughs>